Hello and welcome to the module Standards and Regulations Pertinent to Nanomaterials. My name is Gurumurthy Ramachandran and I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences. By the end of this module, learners should be able to do the following. Show how occupational exposure limits are established and distinguish among types of occupational exposure limits. Show how occupational exposure bans or provisional exposure limits can be set in the absence of reliable toxicological evidence. And third, locate relevant occupational exposure limits for nanomaterials and select an appropriate benchmark exposure level for a nanomaterial. Why do we need occupational exposure limits or OELs? The basic idea behind an OEL is that we would like to limit airborne exposure to potentially hazardous agents to a concentration below which there is no significant threat to worker health. How do we determine this safe level? OELs are determined from human and animal studies. They serve as benchmarks or guidelines for assessing and controlling workplace exposures and for triggering the use of personal protective equipment or PPE and implementing medical surveillance. OELs for nanomaterials would be useful in reducing the health risk to workers exposed to engineered nanoparticles by providing risk managers and health professionals with a quantitative basis for assessing the effectiveness of risk management practices, for example, the use of engineering controls. There are very few risk-based OELs for engineered nanomaterials or ENMs because of limited toxicological data. Mass-based OELs, which exist for the bulk form of the material, that is, larger particle sizes of a material of a given chemical composition, may not be appropriate for those same materials at the nanoscale. The use of mass-based OELs may leave workers underprotected. Thus, there is a need to develop OELs for engineered nanomaterials. This task is made more difficult by the fact that the physico-chemical properties of engineered nanoparticles and the operational parameters of the processes that create them are varied, which may result in different toxic potential. The various physico-chemical combinations are so large as to be impractical to assess toxicity and to develop an OEL for distinct nanomaterial variants. This does not mean that OELs for specific materials should not be developed. Rather, it means that OELs may need to be developed for specific categories of nanomaterials with common hazard potential based on parameters such as molecular structure or physical chemical characteristics. The concept of establishing airborne worker exposure limits for potentially hazardous agents is based on the principle of establishing, number one, quantitative relationships between the magnitude and duration of exposure to an industrial substance and the nature and the magnitude of the response of the worker. And second, limiting airborne exposure to potentially hazardous agents to a concentration below which there is no significant threat to worker health. OELs have been established for airborne chemicals for more than 100 years. This concept traces back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries with the studies of Gruber in 1883 on carbon monoxide and Cobert in 1912 on 20 industrial substances with toxic effects of acute exposure. In the first 40 years of the 20th century, the number of exposure limits rapidly increased. By the early 1940s, control of the occupational environment to prevent adverse health effects from hazardous substances was becoming an accepted principle. More than 6,000 OELs have been established worldwide, according to Dr. Schulte and his group at the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. OELs have been developed by a number of organizations and government agencies and given different names. For example, maximum allowable concentrations, threshold limit values, permissible exposure limits, recommended exposure limits or RELs, and provisional hygiene standards. The existence of an OEL does not necessarily imply that it will be protective for all workers. Legal OELs are required to be used by the employer to control exposure to below the limit. OELs are used to trigger the need for personal protective equipment 
for example respirators, and the establishment of a medical surveillance program. OELs have led to the implementation of overall risk assessment practices for entire industrial processes such as engineering controls to reduce exposures, the training and education of workers, and the implementation of good work practices. There are a variety of types of occupational exposure limits for particulates. The first one is count-based exposure limits. Fibrous dust particles with an aspect ratio that is length to diameter ratio greater than 3 to 1 are typically evaluated as the number of fibers per cubic centimeter. Length, diameter, and biopersistence in the lung are also important besides the raw count. Fibers can be natural, synthetic, or mineral, and much of the history of fiber-related research primarily grew out of the health and exposure issues regarding asbestos. Critical in the health consideration of fibers, in addition to dose, are length, diameter, and biopersistence in the lung. As new information was developed, OELs for asbestos have been reduced from 5 million particles per cubic feet, that is MMPCF, in 1946, to the current OSHA standard of 0.1 fibers per cubic centimeter. Mass-based exposure limits have units of milligrams per cubic meter, or micrograms per cubic meter. The units of measurement have varied over time with some fibrogenic aerosols such as crystalline silica, initially measured in units of millions of particles per cubic feet of air, and more recently measured as mass per unit volume of air, for example, micrograms per cubic meter for crystalline silica. Non-fibrogenic dusts that did not have specific established toxic effects were treated as nuisance or low toxicity dusts with assigned OELs that were relatively high. In an early recognition of the significance of the smaller sized fraction of dust that could reach the alveolar region of the lungs, the respirable fraction was assigned a separate value in the US, that is 15 milligrams per cubic meter total dust and 5 milligrams per cubic meter respirable dust. Over time, it was realized that the use of the term nuisance dust for poorly soluble low toxicity or PSLT dusts may be inappropriate to describe their inhalation hazards. These dusts were subsequently referred to by various organizations as particles not otherwise classified, or PNOC, and uh, particles not otherwise specified, or PNOS. Epidemiological studies and long-term animal studies indicate that such a broad classification was not appropriate and that particle size may be a critical factor in influencing toxicity. Size-selected deposition curves were developed, such as the ISO, CE, and ACGIH curves for inhalable thoracic and respirable penetration into the respiratory tract. Nanoparticles, that is particles less than 100 nanometers in diameter, have around 30 to 99% probability of depositing in the human respiratory tract and a 20 to 50% probability of depositing in the alveolar region. Quantitative risk assessment, or QRA, is used in setting OELs when adequate data are available concerning the relationship between the external exposure or the internal dose of a hazardous agent and an adverse response to that exposure in animals or humans. QRA provides estimates of the severity and likelihood of an adverse response associated with exposure to a hazardous agent. While ultimately epidemiologic studies are most useful, it is not likely that they will be available for some time for many nanomaterials. When information is known about the route of exposure and mechanism of toxicity, physiologically based pharmacokinetic models can be used to extrapolate the dose administered in animal studies to humans. For engineered nanomaterials, in the foreseeable future, most QRAs will involve the extrapolation of animal data to humans. In the meantime, there is an increasing amount of data from animal studies for some engineered nanomaterials that may be adequate for conducting a quantitative risk assessment. This flowchart shows the process of conducting a quantitative risk assessment. Standard risk assessment methods can be used 
to estimate the working lifetime risk of an occupational disease from exposure to nanoparticles. These methods generally involve evaluating the available data, that is dose response data in animals, selecting the adverse response that are non-reversible and clinically significant, determining the critical dose, for example, the benchmark dose associated with a specific level of risk, calculating the human equivalent dose, accounting for the species specific differences such as target tissue volume or surface area, dose rate, and or metabolism, and determining the working lifetime exposure concentration that would result in that dose, including consideration of deposition, uptake, and clearance. What is considered an ideal animal data set for use in QRA? The ideal animal data set for estimating occupational respiratory disease risks in workers is a chronic inhalation study. Chronic exposures in animals, that is 104 weeks in rats, is treated as equivalent to a full, that is 45 years, working lifetime exposure in humans. Chronic studies are available for some nanoparticles such as titanium dioxide, carbon black, and diesel exhaust particulate. For carbon nanotubes, only subchronic studies involving 20 to 90 days of exposure are available, such as the studies by Drew et al. in 2009, Ma Hock et al. in 2009, and Paulun in 2010. Adjustment of study results from non-chronic studies in animals may be needed based on mechanistic understanding of the relationship between short and long-term effects or to account for uncertainty in these mechanisms. There are a variety of strategies for developing occupational exposure limits for nanomaterials. Developing OELs is dependent primarily on the available toxicity information. As with all potential occupational hazards, the assessment of risk of nanomaterials requires the relevant hazard and exposure information that can be used in developing an OEL. When there are adequate toxicity data, the approach shown on the leftmost branch in this figure is often used for the development of OELs in the United States. This involves conducting QRAs of published data sets and extrapolating to working periods such as 8 hours a day, 40 hours a week for a 45-year working lifetime. When there is suggestive or inadequate toxicity data, other approaches for control guidance such as development of in-house occupational exposure limits, control banding, or performance-based exposure control limits have been developed. Let us first consider an example of a substance for which QRA can be conducted, ultrafine titanium dioxide. While discussing this, I will be switching back and forth between slides 12 and 13. As we can see by reviewing the flowchart for QRA in slide 13, we need to establish a dose-response relationship in an animal study. We then need to establish a lung tissue benchmark dose in the animal model. Then after adjusting for species difference in lung surface area, we can estimate the equivalent lung tissue dose in humans. This can then be used to calculate the working lifetime exposure concentration. Now going back to slide 12, we see that for ultrafine titanium dioxide, rat bioassay data show carcinogenicity, as shown by the study by Heinrich et al. in 1995. This can then be used to estimate the particle surface area dose in the lungs associated with a 1 in 1,000 excess risk of rat lung tumors. And we can extrapolate that dose to humans by adjusting for species differences in lung surface area. Human lung dosimetry models are then used to estimate the working lifetime exposure concentration associated with the particle dose in the lungs, as shown in this slide again on slide 13. The model selection can influence the risk estimates. For ultrafine titanium dioxide, that is particles of titanium dioxide less than 100 nanometers, the 95% lower confidence limit working lifetime mean concentration 
associated with a 1 in 1,000 excess risk of lung cancer was 0.04 to 0.54 milligrams per cubic meter, depending on the model used. This slide shows the assessment of lung cancer risk from ultrafine titanium dioxide using different models. And as you can see in the last two columns, each model produces a different maximum likelihood estimate or MLE and a different 95% lower confidence limit or LCL. Although various dose response models adequately fit the RAT data and could conceivably be used to develop recommendations for occupational exposures to titanium dioxide, the use of a model averaging procedure incorporates both statistical variability and model uncertainty into confidence limit estimation. Model averaging uses various dose response models and constructs an average dose response model. And in this slide, the last row shows the model averaged estimate for the lung cancer risk that is produced by the different models. The model average estimate of the working lifetime mean concentration of ultrafine titanium dioxide associated with a 1 in 1,000 excess risk of lung cancer is 1.62 milligrams per cubic meter with a 95% lower confidence limit of 0.3 milligrams per cubic meter. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, utilizes the 95% lower confidence limit estimates as the basis for the recommended exposure limit, or REL, as opposed to the maximum likelihood estimate, to allow for model uncertainty in the estimates. Thus, the NIOSH REL for ultrafine titanium dioxide is 0.3 milligrams per cubic meter. Now let us consider the example of single-walled carbon nanotubes. In addition to causing effects similar to mesothelioma, carbon nanotubes have been also shown to cause other effects in animal studies such as pulmonary granulomas, where granuloma formation is a normal foreign body response of the lung to high doses of particulate matter, pulmonary fibrosis, genetic mutation, carcinogenic potential, and cardiovascular effects. Again, these are all animal studies, and there is a lack of human epidemiological studies relating to the health effects of nanoparticles. The table in this slide shows details of rat and mouse studies and the dose and outcome of the experiments. In addition to the data in the table in the previous slide, there are more definitive studies. Data from Ma Hawk et al. in 2009 involved Wistar rats exposed at 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 2.5 milligrams per cubic meter for six hours a day, five days a week for 13 weeks. Based on this and previous studies, it was determined that an OEL for a risk of pulmonary fibrosis of less than 1 in 1,000 over a working lifetime would be less than the limit of quantitation of the NIOSH analytical method 5040 which is one microgram per cubic meter for an eight-hour time-weighted average. Therefore, the current recommended exposure limit for carbon nanotubes is one microgram per cubic meter, and this was established by NIOSH in 2013. The risk management implications of the computed exposure level in combination with the inability to measure the presence of carbon nanotubes below this level could require the use of closed systems or placing workers in full body protection. Such an approach may or may not be practical for some operations. The previous two slides about carbon nanotubes showed studies and recommended exposure limit based on mass concentrations. However, mass per unit volume may not be the best metric for evaluating airborne concentrations of carbon nanotubes based on results from some short-term animal studies which implicate the role of fiber dimension and biopersistence in causing toxicological response. Although results from animal studies of carbon nanotubes do not provide specific information on the relationship between fiber dimension and response, it appears that exposure to carbon nanotubes 
can elicit responses that are similar to asbestos fibers. In this study, the mesothelial lining of the body cavity of mice were directly exposed to asbestos fibers as well as multi-wall carbon nanotubes by intraperitoneal injection with a 50 microgram dose. And the acute, which is 24 hour and seven day response was measured for these exposures. First, it is interesting to see the electron microscope images of the two types of particles and how similar they are in appearance. Second, the graph on the right hand side shows the lesion area for exposure to different types of particles. It is clear that short fibers of any kind are less toxic than long fibers. Thus, the lesion area for short fiber amocyte asbestos is much less compared to that for long fiber amocyte asbestos. Most significantly, the long, that is greater than 20 micrometers straight multi-wall carbon nanotubes produced inflammatory response and formation of granuloma similar to that by long fiber amocyte asbestos fibers. It may be useful to evaluate workplace exposures using exposure assessment methods similar to that used for asbestos exposures. That is, for example, the NIOSH method 7402 or the ISO 10312 methods. Although data are lacking to perform quantitative analysis of risk based on carbon nanotube dimension and number, utilizing the OEL for asbestos of 0.1 fibers per cubic centimeter may be a reasonable approach in the interim. OELs may be needed for all commercially viable form of carbon nanotubes and carbon nanofibers. However, the range of toxicity that might exist for the different forms of carbon nanotubes including the various metal catalysts, has not been determined. However, the use of the OEL for asbestos will likely require the use of electron microscopy for analysis, since the method used for measuring asbestos, that is phase contrast microscopy, cannot detect fibers less than 250 nanometers in diameter. This means that individual or agglomerated single wall carbon nanotubes and multi wall carbon nanotubes smaller than 250 nanometers in diameter would not be detected. Given the propensity for carbon nanotubes to agglomerate and exist as airborne clusters or clumps, the criteria used for counting and sizing would have to account for a variety of structures of different dimensions. ISO method 10312 has been used to evaluate a range of structures for asbestos exposure assessments and may have utility in evaluating carbon nanotube exposures by electron microscopy. The method would need to be incorporated in toxicology studies as a dose metric to provide for a complete hazard evaluation and risk management process. Chronic dose response data for both non-cancer and cancer endpoints are needed to better understand the working lifetime risks. However, the current toxicology data could be used to develop initial risk estimates and benchmark OELs for use in evaluating the effectiveness of engineering controls and to trigger the use of PPE and the need for medical surveillance. Now let us also look at the interesting case of the quantitative risk assessment for nano silver. NIOSH considered subchronic inhalation studies in rats using 15 to 20 nanometer silver nanoparticles, where the health effects were early stage lung inflammation and liver bile duct hyperplasia. The QRA also used a physiologically based pharmacokinetic or PBPK model to estimate the working lifetime exposure to silver nanoparticles that would not be expected to result in adverse effects and this turned out to be in the range 0.19 to 195 micrograms per cubic meter as an 8 hour time weighted average. However, this range of estimates depended on assumptions about the particle size, biologically relevant tissue dose, rat effect level estimate and PBPK model parameters. Based on these NIOSH estimated that exposure to a range of 47 
to 253 micrograms per cubic meter of silver nanoparticles over a 45-year working lifetime would result in an amount of silver in the skin equivalent to the minimum amount observed in humans with argyria. Now the current NIOSH recommended exposure limit for silver metal dust is 10 micrograms per cubic meter TWA as total dust. The recommended exposure limit estimates for nano silver based on the animal data were both above and below the current NIOSH REL. The uncertainties in these estimates include the quantification of the silver tissue doses, the clinical significance of the rat lung and liver effects, the role of particle size and solubility on the observed effects, and the selection of uncertainty factors. NIOSH considers the currently available data as to be too limited to develop a recommended exposure limit for silver that is specific to particle size. And therefore, NIOSH recommends that worker exposures to silver nanomaterials do not exceed the NIOSH REL of 10 micrograms per cubic meter as an 8-hour time-weighted average. We have been considering examples of titanium dioxide and carbon nanotubes where there is adequate toxicity information to conduct quantitative risk assessment. Now let us consider the other branches of this flowchart when we don't have adequate toxicity information. One approach to developing in-house or ad hoc OELs is to rely on a combination of internal or in-house and external data derived from the literature. Toxicity data are incomplete or may not exist during the development of the OEL. This requires collaboration among experts in risk assessment, toxicology, and exposure assessment. One approach is to derive initial estimates of OELs for engineered nanomaterials by adjusting exposure limits that exist for bulk forms of the same material, and these are called as benchmark exposure limits. This table shows several benchmark exposure limits based on this approach. The recommended benchmark limits are geared to minimizing the exposure in accordance with the state of the art in measurements. Since these limits are not based on observed health effects, a health risk may still exist for workers, even when these recommended limits are followed. Therefore, benchmark limits should not be confused with health-based occupational exposure limits. There are two sets of occupational exposure limits shown in this slide. The second column shows OELs from the British Standards Institute, or BSI, while the third column shows OELs by the German organization IFA. All nanomaterials are grouped into four hazard categories with assigned benchmark exposure levels, or BELs. BELs are described as pragmatic guidance levels only, and are derived from OELs for larger particle forms on the assumption that the hazard potential of the nanoparticle form is greater than the large particle form. First, there is the fibrous category defined as an insoluble nanomaterial with a high aspect ratio, that is a ratio greater than 3 to 1 and a length greater than 5,000 nanometers or 5 micrometers which is assigned a BEL of 0.01 fibers per cubic centimeter. And this is one-tenth of the asbestos OEL prescribed in the U.S. and elsewhere. In the second and third rows, the OELs for bioperistant granular materials are shown for density less than 6,000 kilograms per cubic meter and greater than 6,000 kilograms per cubic meter. For insoluble or poorly soluble, non-carcinogenic, mutagenic, asthmagenic, or reproductive effect-causing nanomaterials, BSI proposes a risk ranking system with a mass-based approach. A guidance value can be derived by using a factor of 0.066, that is 15 times lower compared to the working exposure limit of the bulk material. The working exposure limit is the limit established as a regulatory limit based on the non-nanomaterial. Thus, if we use the OEL for fine titanium dioxide, for which the NIOSH REL is 2.4 milligrams per cubic meter, 
and we multiply this by 0 0.066, we obtain 0 0.16 milligrams per cubic meter. This is clearly more conservative, that is lower than the OEL derived using quantitative risk assessment, which was, as you recall, 0 0.3 milligrams per cubic meter. Then we come to the CMAR category, defined as any nanomaterial which is already classified in its larger particle form as a carcinogenic, mutagenic, asthmagenic, or reproductive toxicant. Nanomaterials in the CMAR category are assigned a BEL at one-tenth of the mass-based OEL for its larger particle form. Finally, there is a soluble category defined as a soluble nanomaterial not in fibrous or CMAR category, which is assigned a BEL at one-half of the mass-based OEL for its larger particle form. Now we come to the third column. The IFA recommended the following benchmark limits to be used for an eight-hour work shift and to be used for monitoring the effectiveness of protective measures in the workplace. For CNTs, for which no such manufacturer's declaration is available, a provisional fiber concentration of 0.01 fibers per cubic centimeter should not be exceeded, based on the exposure risk ratio for asbestos. It is recommended that only carbon nanotubes that have been tested for adverse health effects similar to those of asbestos should be used. For metals, metal oxides, and other bioperistant granular materials with a density greater than 6,000 kilograms per cubic meter, a particle number concentration of 20,000 particles per cubic centimeter in the range of measurement between 1 and 100 nanometers should not be exceeded. For bioperistant granular nanomaterials with a density below 6,000 kilograms per cubic meter, a particle number concentration of 40,000 particles per cubic centimeter in the measured range between 1 and 100 nanometers should not be exceeded. For nanoscale liquid particles such as fats, hydrocarbons, and siloxanes, the applicable maximum workplace limit values should be employed owing to the absence of effects of solid particles. A third approach is commonly called control banding. In the 1970s, a risk matrix was used by chemical facilities to predict the potential and severity of an event, that is, explosion or chemical release. In the 1980s, the pharmaceutical industry attempted to stratify hazards and link them to control strategies to protect workers. In the 1990s, levels of control were related to carcinogenicity. In 1996, the pharmaceutical industry expanded the use of the matrix to include biosafety levels based on toxicological data. In 1997, the Chemical Industries Association used risk categorization as a control guide that linked five elements of control banding. Hazard categorization, hazard classification, that is toxic and corrosive, risk phrases, guideline control levels, that is OELs, and recommendations for each hazard category. And they also created occupational exposure bands to be used when there was no established OEL. In 1998, the UK Health and Safety Executive developed the COSH Essentials, where COSH stands for Control of Substances Hazardous to Human Health. This was a generic online risk assessment that incorporated ways to predict exposure. The approach by the pharmaceutical industry was designed for substances with little to no toxicological data. New chemicals are treated as highly potent and controls are meant to reduce exposure to between 1 and 10 micrograms per cubic meter. Containment is verified with a surrogate and additional containment and PPE for substances known to be toxic are advised. Preliminary hazard assessment is required before scale-up occurs, including some toxicological data and potency information. The results are used to develop a health hazard band that includes dustiness, process, quantity, frequency, and duration. 
This slide shows the hazard and control banning summary for the pharmaceutical model. Substances were placed in five categories 1, 2, 3A, 3B, and 4 that were based on the potency of the pharmaceutical compound. For low potency substances, where greater than 100 milligrams a day dose is acceptable, an occupational exposure band of greater than 100 micrograms per cubic meter is proposed and the exposure control includes conventional open equipment with incidental contact with the compound. Category 2 is for moderate potency substances where 10 to 100 milligrams a day dose is acceptable. An occupational exposure band of 100 to 10 micrograms per cubic meter is proposed and the exposure control includes gasketed and flanged equipment laminar flow, directional laminar flow, and enclosed transfers. As the potency of the compound increases, the exposure bands become lower and the level of control increases. In category 4, for extremely potent substances, where the daily dose cannot exceed 0.01 milligrams a day, the exposure band is less than 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter and controls include high containment, closed process trains, isolators, and redundant tighter containment systems. A similar approach was developed by the UK Health and Safety Executive called COSH Essentials, where COSH stands for Control of Substances Hazardous to Health. It is a control banding tool that helps small and medium-sized enterprises to do risk assessments for chemicals and mixtures of chemicals. It identifies the control band, the control approach, and it produces advice on controlling risk from the chemical used in the specified task, and it provides written guidance and documentation as a result of the assessment. But there is one important difference. Rather than develop an OEL band, the tool is used to provide exposure control guidance based on estimates of the hazard. For a given level of hazard defined qualitatively, the tool proposes a level of control that will lead to a certain target concentration range. For example, for a severely irritating and corrosive substance, the control guidance is to enclose the process which will lead to a target concentration range of 0.01 to 0.1 milligrams per cubic meter for dusts and 0.5 to 5 parts per million for vapor. Next we discuss the concept of an occupational exposure band or OEB being promoted by NIOSH. It is a mechanism to quickly and accurately assign chemicals into categories or bands based on their health outcome and potency considerations. The five categories range from A to E, from least to most hazardous. The OEB approach has a lot of potential benefits for agencies as well as other stakeholders. For the agencies, this approach facilitates more rapid evaluation of health risk, can be used with minimum data. It highlights areas where data are missing. It supports the definition of OEL ranges for families of materials and it provides a screening tool for the development of recommended exposure limits. For stakeholders, this approach provides guidance for materials without OELs. It identifies hazards to be evaluated for elimination or substitution. It is aligned with the Global Harmonized System, GHS, for hazard communication. It facilitates the application of prevention through design principles. But before we discuss OEBs in more detail, we need to describe the Globally Harmonized System, or GHS, for hazard classification and labeling. This is a worldwide initiative to promote standard criteria for classifying and labeling chemicals according to their health, physical, and environmental hazards. The benefits of this are that this system enhances the protection of human health and the environment, promotes sound management of chemicals worldwide, facilitates trade, and the hazard statements in this system are similar 
to the R or risk phrases in the Kosh Essentials framework. What is GHS? It is a common and coherent approach to defining and classifying hazards and communicating information on labels and safety data sheets. The target audiences include workers, consumers, transport workers, and emergency responders. And the GHS provides the underlying infrastructure for establishment of national comprehensive chemical safety programs. The GHS elements include classification criteria for health and environmental hazards, physical hazards and mixtures, and hazard communication using labels and safety data sheets. This slide provides an overview of the NIOSH exposure banding approach. It is a tiered approach with three tiers that have different levels of ease of use, accessibility, speed of evaluation on the vertical axis, and have increasing data requirements and OEB confidence and required user expertise on the horizontal axis. Tier 1 is the easiest to use and is relatively quick to evaluate and requires minimal data. We use the GHS H codes or hazard codes to identify bad actors that are in categories C, D, and E. In Tier 2, we determine if sufficient data are available to assign bands with more confidence. Tier 3 is a more complex approach requiring more toxicity information and it uses expert judgment and all available data to perform an assessment of health risk. We start at Tier 1 and then move on to Tier 2 and 3 as resources become available. This and some of the other slides in this presentation are courtesy of Dr. L.T. McKernan of NIOSH. Tier 1 is qualitative, and the user can be a health and safety generalist. A Tier 1 evaluation utilizes the GHS hazard statements and categories to identify chemicals that have the potential to cause irreversible health effects. Tier 2 is quantitative, and its user can be a skilled occupational hygienist. A Tier 2 evaluation produces a more refined OEB based on the point of departure data from reliable sources. Data availability and quality are considered. Tier 3 is based on the weight of evidence, and the user of this approach is typically a toxicologist or an experienced occupational hygienist. Tier 3 involves the integration of all available data and determining the degree of conviction of the outcome. Why do we need a tiered approach? In many cases, we need detailed expertise to make judgments about these various types of toxicity endpoints. Thus, in Tier 1, we can rely on existing hazard classifications and it does not require any independent toxicology evaluation. If we want to use Tier 2, we need to be adequately familiar to find summary data from authoritative reviews and in some cases weigh among studies with well-defined criteria. And if we want to use Tier 3, we need to be able to review primary data and make judgments about effect adversity. The five hazard classes A through E for tiers 1 and 2 are based on the findings for eight standard toxicological endpoints. Acute toxicity, skin corrosion and irritation, serious eye damage and irritation, respiratory and skin sensitization, germ cell mutagenicity, carcinogenicity, reproductive or developmental toxicity, and target organ toxicity resulting from repeated exposure. Each physical or health hazard is a hazard class. For example, carcinogenicity is a hazard class. A hazard class may be subdivided into several hazard categories based on the degree of severity of the hazard. Placing a chemical into a hazard class and where necessary a hazard category is the concept of classification, determining not only the hazard but also the severity of the effect. This slide shows the proposed NIOSH hazard classes and categories. 
and for each hazard class there are several hazard categories. With this scheme in mind, the Tier 1 classification proceeds as follows. First, make sure that the chemical of interest has no OEL. Then we locate the GHS hazard codes and categories in recommended databases. Next, we compare the hazard codes and categories with NIOSH criteria for each health endpoint. We can then assign the band for each relevant health endpoint based on criteria. Finally, we can assign a Tier 1 occupational exposure band for the chemical based on the most protective endpoint band. This table shows the health endpoints and NIOSH hazard bands. For each hazard endpoint that corresponds to a hazard class, there are several hazard categories. We determine the hazard category based on the GHS hazard statements and hazard or H codes. For example, for an acute toxicity endpoint, there are several hazard categories 1, 2, 3, 4. The GHS statement corresponding to category 3 and 4 is harmful if swallowed, harmful if inhaled, harmful in contact with skin, toxic if swallowed, toxic if inhaled, toxic in contact with skin. While the hazard statement for category 1 is fatal if swallowed, fatal if inhaled, fatal in contact with skin. The H codes corresponding to these statements are shown in the next row. At the very top, we can see the occupational exposure bands corresponding to the various categories and hazard endpoints. The same chemical might have another endpoint. This table shows the first three endpoints, acute toxicity, skin corrosion or irritation, and serious eye damage or eye irritation. This slide shows the next three endpoints, respiratory and skin sensitization, germ cell mutagenicity, and carcinogenicity, and their corresponding hazard categories, GHS statements and H codes. And this slide shows the next final endpoints, toxic to reproduction, specific target organ toxicity for single exposure, and specific target organ toxicity for repeated exposure, and their corresponding hazard categories, GHS statements, and H codes. NIOSH has conducted extended validation of the Tier 1 approach. They have compared bands obtained from Tier 1 process for 744 chemicals with full shift occupational exposure limits from the following authoritative bodies. The NIOSH Recommended Exposure Limits, or RELS, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, Permissible Exposure Limits, PELS, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, or ACGIH, Threshold Limit Values, or TLVs, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, or AIHA, Workplace Environmental Exposure Limits, or WHEELS, the California OSHA program, PELS, and the German Commission for the Investigation of Health Hazards of Chemical Compounds in the Work Area, or MAC, translated as the Maximum Workplace Concentration. The Tier 1 validation criteria for vapors are that greater than 80% of Tier 1 bands should be at least as protective as the occupational exposure limit. The cut points for the Tier 1 vapor banding are band A greater than 100 parts per million, band B is greater than 10 and less than 100 parts per million, band C greater than 1 and less than or equal to 10 parts per million, band D is greater than 0 0.1 and less than or equal to 1 part per million, and band E is less than or equal to 0 0.1 parts per million. For example, if the OEL for a vapor is 5 parts per million, then we want the tier 1 band to be C, 
that is greater than 1 and less than or equal to 10 parts per million, or D, that is greater than 0 0.1 and less than or equal to 1 part per million, or E, that is less than 0 0.1 parts per million. So that there is a value in each of the tier 1 bands at least as small as the OEL, because 1 part per million is less than 5 parts per million, 0 0.1 parts per million is less than 5 parts per million, and 0 0.01 ppm is less than 5 parts per million. Tier 1 bands, if assigned, can only be C, D, or E, so they will always be at least as protective for chemicals with OELs that would fall into the bands A, B, or C. This graph shows the results of the validation for Tier 1 for vapors. On the horizontal axis, we see the OELs for vapors. These are divided into five categories A through E. Category A corresponds to chemicals for which OELs are greater than 100 parts per million. Category 2 is for substances with OELs between 10 and 100 parts per million. Category C for 1 to 10 parts per million. D is for 0 0.1 to 1 part per million and E is for less than 0 0.1 parts per million. The vertical axis shows the exposure band using the Tier 1 approach. As mentioned earlier, Tier 1 bands, if assigned, can only be C, D, or E, so they will always be at least as protective for chemicals with OELs that would fall into bands A, B, or C. The results have been color-coded for ease of observation we see that the uncolored or white boxes correspond to vapors for which the Tier 1 OEL band is more protective than the OEL. The four white boxes in the top row correspond to vapors that have OELs in bands A through D, but for which the Tier 1 approach assigns band E. The green boxes correspond to vapors for which the Tier 1 OEL band is equally as protective as the OEL based band. Both the OEL and Tier 1 lead to the same band. The yellow and red boxes correspond to vapors for which the Tier 1 OEL band is less protective than the OEL based band. So based on these data, we see that 77% of the chemicals had Tier 1 bands equally or more protective than the corresponding OEL based bands and 23 percent of the chemicals had tier 1 bands that were less protective than the corresponding OEL based bands. The tier 1 validation criteria for particulates now are that greater than 80 percent of the tier 1 bands should be at least as protective as the OEL. The cut points for the particles are band A greater than 10 milligrams per cubic meter, band B greater than 1 and less than or equal to 10 milligrams per cubic meter, band C is greater than 0 0.1 and less than or equal to 1 milligram per cubic meter, band D is greater than 0 0.01 and less than or equal to 0 0.1 milligram per cubic meter, and band E is less than or equal to 0 0.01 milligram per cubic meter. This graph shows the results of the validation for Tier 1 for particulates. As for the case of vapors, on the horizontal axis we see the OELs for particulates. These are divided into five categories A through E. Category A corresponds to chemicals for which the OELs are greater than 10 milligrams per cubic meter. Category 2 for OELs between 1 and 10 milligrams per cubic meter. Category C for 0 0.1 to 1 milligram per cubic meter. D is for 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 milligram per cubic meter. And category E is for less than 0 0.01 milligram per cubic meter. The vertical axis shows the exposure band using the tier 1 approach. As in the case of vapors, the results have been color-coded for ease of observation. We see that the uncolored or white boxes correspond to particulates 
for which the tier 1 OEL band is more protective than the OEL. The green boxes correspond to particulates for which the tier 1 OEL band is equally as protective as the OEL based band. The yellow and red boxes correspond to particulates for which the tier 1 OEL band is less protective than the OEL based band. We see that 84.7% of the chemicals had tier 1 bands equally or more protective than the corresponding OEL based bands and 15.3% of the chemicals had tier 1 bands less protective than the corresponding OEL based bands. Let us try and apply the tier 1 approach using an example compound, zinc oxide nanoparticles. Zinc oxide is used as an additive in numerous materials and products including rubber, ceramics, chemical products, compounds, paints, glass, catalysts, and cosmetics. The current NIOSH REL for the bulk form of zinc oxide is 5 milligrams per cubic meter as an 8-hour TWA and 15 milligrams per cubic meter as the NIOSH ceiling limit. These may not be applicable for the nanoparticle form of zinc oxide. Where can we get the GHS statements and hazard codes or H codes? One source is the material safety data sheet for this substance provided by the manufacturer. The safety data sheet provides the following hazard statements. It causes serious eye irritation with the H code H319, respiratory irritation corresponding to a code of H335, and skin irritation corresponding to a code H315. The first step is to locate the GHS H codes and categories from recommended data sources, in this case the safety data sheet. Each H code for an endpoint also points to a hazard category. Thus, we have the H code and hazard category for the three endpoints relating to zinc oxide. We now go back to the table corresponding to the health endpoints and hazard bands. We locate each of the H codes and hazard categories for each health endpoint. There are three relevant health endpoints for nano zinc oxide. For each endpoint, the H code leads to the same OEL band greater than 0.1 and less than or equal to 1 milligram per cubic meter. If we had a substance for which each endpoint and H code led to a different band, we would select the most conservative, that is the lowest exposure band. Once we have completed a tier 1 analysis, we can move to a tier 2 analysis provided there is sufficient information to enable this. Tier 2 is a semi-quantitative approach that requires that the user do a thorough search of several publicly accessible databases in order to retrieve hazard information. Tier 2 is performed by a skilled industrial hygienist or toxicologist and relies heavily on information gathered from secondary data sources. Examples of these sources are from the government like the CDC and the EPA and professional health agencies. Tier 2 also has a threshold for data sufficiency, meaning that if there isn't enough information available, a Tier 2 evaluation cannot be performed. The strategy for performing Tier 2 is prescriptive and outlined in detail by NIOSH to ensure that the results of the process are consistent among users. After a Tier 2 evaluation, there is potential for a chemical to be moved into a more or less protective band from the Tier 1 OEB. As previously mentioned, the Tier 2 band is more reliable than a Tier 1 band. Tier 2 is based on the findings for eight standard toxicological endpoints and our health outcomes. These are the same endpoints as in Tier 1. Acute toxicity, skin corrosion and irritation, serious eye damage and irritation, respiratory and skin sensitization, germ cell mutagenicity, carcinogenicity, reproductive or developmental toxicity, target organ toxicity resulting from repeated exposure.
some of the endpoints draw on categorical health outcomes, for example, mild, moderate, or severe. Others are based on quantitative toxicity information and or potency data, such as the LD50s, LC50s, and the NOELs. There are a number of important principles for Tier 2. For each of the eight endpoints, a search of the authoritative databases must be completed in order to gather summary toxicity information. Once information on each endpoint is gathered, a total determinant score and or occupational exposure band is assigned. The total determinant score, or TDS, is an indication of the presence or absence of data. It essentially tells the user whether or not there are enough data to make a decision about the potency of the chemical in question. Different types of data contribute to the TDS differently. For example, a cancer IUR, or an inhalation unit risk, which is a quantitative potency measure of cancer risk, describes a lot about the hazardous nature of a chemical. And so the presence of this information contributes 30 points to the TDS. An LD50 value contributes only 5 points. And the sum of all health endpoint TDSs must be at least 30 for a chemical to be banded in Tier 2. As mentioned earlier, this is done automatically by the NIOSH software. Tier 1 uses a very conservative approach due to fewer data requirements. By performing a Tier 2 evaluation, the user can incorporate quantitative data and refine the band assignment. Following Tier 2, an additional level of evaluation can be performed the necessary data and user expertise are available. Finally, we come to Tier 3. It requires a toxicologist or an experienced industrial hygienist, and it requires that we determine the critical study from which the scientifically sound point of departure can be determined. And it requires that a quantitative risk assessment be done to determine the occupational exposure band or the occupational exposure limit. This is the same as the QRA or the quantitative risk assessment that we have discussed earlier in this module. To summarize this module, toxicological evidence for setting OELs for nanomaterials is available only for a few substances. For these substances, QRA can be used for setting occupational exposure limits. In the absence of such data, other approaches based on adjusting the OELs for the bulk form of the materials and control banding can be used to arrive at pragmatic, ad hoc occupational exposure bands. Such approaches use the precautionary principle and provide very conservative exposure limits or bands. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, or METFAST, program. A collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health.